A dozen or so miles downstream from Rome, where the Tiber runs out through the marshes to the sea, stands the town of Ostia. Here, apartment blocks, shops, workshops, civic buildings and temples all survive in close proximity. So much remains, in fact, that we can see from this one site how all the disparate elements of a town fitted together to make the physical setting of the urbanized way of life that was the hallmark of Roman civilization. This is Ostia. It's a sobering thought that something like 40,000 people may have lived and worked in this small town. It measures less than one mile by a half. And it's impressive too that, as in most Roman towns, they were provided not only with housing, but with the full range of structures catering for all needs. I want to show you examples of the principal building types that make up this town. I'm walking along the main street, and here, beside me, is a large bathing establishment. An earlier bathhouse of the Julio-Claudian period was originally here, slightly further north. Almost next door is the theatre, backed by huge open colonnades. Next door again, four temples are elegantly laid out at the back of an open square. Not all the temple precincts were as neatly planned as that, but they were scattered throughout the town. And by late imperial times, there were also a good many bathing establishments, both public and private. Then there were the hundreds of small shops, like these, or these opposite the theatre. And finally, of course, buildings for local government, mostly here, about the Forum. It was the Roman achievement to spread the amenities of city living surprisingly far down the social scale. And indeed, Ostia is very much a working town, packed with warehouses like this one. And with apartment blocks here, in marked contrast to the spacious atrium houses of Pompeii or Cosa. However, before you assume that Ostia can be taken as the typical Roman town, let me explain just how special it was. It began life sometime in the 4th century BC as a fortified encampment guarding the river mouth. You can still see the outline of the camp in these streets about the city centre. This little settlement covered only about five acres, and building must soon have spread out along the approach roads, which, as you see, don't conform to the normal grid pattern of Roman town planning. Then, in the time of Sulla, probably around 80 BC, new walls were set round the town, and the whole area organised about a main east-west axis, the Decumanus Maximus, which crossed the other main street, the Cardo Maximus, here in the Forum. This was the town of the Julio-Claudian period, covering some 160 acres. But it was liable to frequent flooding, and so in the reign of Hadrian, much of the ground was raised and large parts of the town rebuilt. Most of the new town was laid out on the standard Roman grid, with streets dividing the space up into rectangular blocks you can see that the whole of the excavated area is tightly packed with building. Very roughly, one can detect a business quarter with warehouses along the original river front, civic centre about the Forum, and something approaching a seaside town with a few more spacious houses down towards the original shoreline. The surrounding land would have provided food, the wooded hills probably timber for shipbuilding and repairs, the biggest local industry was almost certainly the collection of salt from pans in the tidal marshes inland. This would undoubtedly have been to supply Rome. And the whole raison d'etre of Ostia was as a service centre for the capital. Its harbours provided for transshipment of goods, principally corn, on their way upriver to Rome. The harbour was vital to Rome, but there was a problem. On this exposed and windy coast, the silty river mouth was an inadequate anchorage. Caesar planned a redevelopment, and Claudius built a huge mole.
but it was not until Trajan's reign in the early 2nd century AD that this immense inland basin was constructed. Thereafter, the harbour town of Portus developed as a second settlement, while Ostia was dramatically and extensively rebuilt. The bulk of what we see now dates from the 2nd century or later, that is, well after the Augustan age. Nonetheless, we know from Vitruvius of the pressure towards vertical living in the capital, and I want to suggest that what you see here at Ostia exemplifies the final development of an urban structure that began to take shape under Augustus. Let's look at the town in detail. At Ostia, there was a relatively abrupt change from country to town. Almost the first thing you would see would be the walls, with their massively built gateways. This is the southern or Laurentum gate. The squared tufa blocks are evidence of its original size and solidity. These walls both provided security and delimited the town. I say they would be almost the first thing you would see, because, like most Roman towns, Ostia has its cemeteries outside the gates. Here, groups of substantial tombs flank the road to Rome, and with their inscriptions and offerings of flowers will have been a constant reminder to the Ostians that they were part of a continuous process of history. This is the main approach to the town. It passes through the Porta Romana into the Decumanus Maximus that runs dead straight past the theatre to the Forum. Here it crossed the other axis, the Cardo Maximus, and here, as in all Roman towns, was the focus of civic life. It is dominated by Hadrian's massive Capitolium. This replaced an earlier triple temple of Jupiter, Juno and Minerva. But the Forum itself is a large open square. At the opposite end, a temple of Rome and Augustus was built, probably by Tiberius. Only the massive substructure remains, although parts of its pediment, faced with white marble from Augustus' new quarries at Luna, have been reconstructed nearby. The Forum was flanked by the Basilica and the Curia, both richly decorated with marble, most probably under Domitian. This pillared hall of the Basilica would have served as a social and commercial centre, while across the road the town council will have met in the rather smaller Curia. These buildings form the administrative and symbolic centre of the town. The two temples, Basilica and Curia. The spaciousness and quality of their building is in marked contrast to the housing around. Remember too that the Forum was one of the very few public open spaces in the town. The main streets provided others, as did the theatre colonnades, but more peaceful open spaces were really only to be found in the precincts attached to the temples, of which there were quite a few. We are going to look at these three. Here, the temples of the precinct of Cybele surround the private open space that the ceremonial required. Yet the precinct lies conveniently beside the thoroughfare of the Cardo Maximus. The Temple of Hercules is more typical. It was probably built around 100 BC, before ribbon development reached this far and its east-west axis puts it at an angle to the street. The surviving base is evidence of its magnificence. Hard stone foundations, elegant mouldings, a squared tufa podium, and to the front, fine travertine steps. Yet this grand building faces only onto a cramped court which it shares with two other temples. A neater rectangular court that was actually rebuilt under Augustus fronts these four republican temples that are packed side by side next to the theatre 
and hemmed in on three other sides by buildings. This pressure on space is very much a feature of Ostia as it was of Augustan Rome. You can see how the buildings line the rectangular grid of streets. Though the main roads are wide enough to accommodate heavy wagons quite easily, the side streets are much more constricted. There were also alleys between the warehouses. When the walls were complete, this one must have been a lightless and unsavoury place indeed. Yet, if we think of Ostia as a working town, such unpleasantness should hardly surprise us. Warehouses were the raison d'etre of the town, and as you can see, well laid out. This is the warehouse of Hortensius, one of the earliest. The wagons passed from the street through into this spacious courtyard, surrounded by columns of tufa, with harder travertine for the corners. You remember that Ostia existed largely to supply Rome, and the most important commodity was corn. It was here, in the rooms off the main courtyard, that the corn was stored. There were long, narrow spaces, with only slit windows. But see how beautifully constructed. This is opus mixtum, that is, opus reticulatum facing, strengthened by interlocked strips of brick. Its neighbour, a mixed goods warehouse, follows the same plan, but on an irregular site and without the colonnade. Next door again, a smaller specialist warehouse was for oil or wine, stored in huge jars sunk in the floor, like these. The town had many warehouses for corn, a few specialising in wine or oil, and several for other goods. You can see how they fill much of the northern quarter, close to the waterfront. I think it's also easy to see that all this movement of goods must have been labour intensive. We know of the existence of many different trade guilds, tugboatmen, lightermen and so on. Surviving mosaics remind us of their work. We know, for instance, that the measurers, checking cargoes on arrival, in store and on dispatch, formed one of the most important groups in Ostia. And I think you have to imagine the town filled with dock workers and shipping clerks. We must now look at the way they lived. By the 2nd century AD, these men and others of their rank were living in apartment blocks built over rows of shops like these. These insuli must have made the streets like narrow canyons. Yet, though they are built cheek by jowl, the join you see in the brickwork is the junction of two separate blocks, the 2nd century insuli of Ostia are finely constructed of cement with hard brick facing, so good that it needed no stucco covering. This block, called the House of Diana, is typical. The ground floor is let off as shops. A passageway leads in to the communal central court, which housed the cistern, so necessary for storing fresh rainwater. It's an attractive little space, but if you imagine it's surrounded by two or even three more stories reached by this common stairway, you will have a better idea. The flats were all on the upper floors. It's difficult to make out the precise arrangement. There may well have been single room apartments as well as others of up to five rooms. Most of the rooms will have had small windows making them dark and cool like these on the ground floor. Above, only the base of the walls remain. Some of the rooms will have looked onto the court or light well, which should at least have been quieter than the street. Others, very likely with balconies, 
will have provided attractive views down the street. The ground floor apartments were given over to shops like these and small businesses. There are eight in this block alone and over 800 in the whole town. Here a single room served as sales or workshop area and a ladder led up to a wooden mezzanine floor where the shopkeeper's family would live literally over the shop, their dwelling lit by a window under the vault. The whole shop front opened directly onto the street, but could be closed by wooden shutters slotted into a groove. There were frequent hot food shops called Thermopolia. This one is unusually large. The bar, by the entrance, provided drinks and food was available inside. And all this is in fact barely 100 yards from the largest warehouse in town and less than 50 yards from the Forum. The area around the House of Diana was certainly densely inhabited, but other apartments nearby are clearly dwellings of quality. Besides the fine mosaic floors in this block, there are other indications of wealth like the painted plaster walls on lower and upper floors. At the rear is a communal garden, rare in Austria. And these wealthy apartments have as many as 12 rooms each. But remember that this is second century building. In Augustan times, the wealthy would have lived in atrium houses, a few of which survive in the western part of the town. This is a slightly simplified plan of one called the House of Jupiter the Thunderer. It's a typical atrium house. The narrow entrance passage leads in from the street between separate shops. The centre of the house was the atrium. This was backed by the master's room, or tablinum. This, in turn, opened onto the peristyle court, all arranged on a single axis. To left and right of the tablinum, arli, or wings, opened directly onto the atrium. These would have been equivalent to our living rooms. The dining rooms and other smaller rooms were fitted in round the atrium and peristyle as convenient. This is the one we have just been looking at. From the street, we pass directly through the entrance passage to the wide atrium. Trees mark the site of the peristyle behind the walled-in tablinum. Small rooms flank the atrium. We can see the surviving impluvium as a reminder of the original opening in the roof. Some doorways have been blocked, but the ala still opens off the corner of the atrium. A similar arrangement of entrance passage, atrium and tablinum is better preserved in this late 3rd century house. The marble and the fine mosaics demonstrate the wealth of its owner. There is even a marbled lined room with a hippocaust. We can see the hot flues that warm the walls a luxury denied to most flat dwellers. Here, there is a separate colonnade around the atrium with a mosaic floor of fine quality. But we're reminded that even the wealthy had to collect their rainwater for a cistern is let in to the corner of the colonnade. In the early days of Ostia, water must have been a problem once the aqueduct had been built, probably in the reign of Gaius, the traditional lavish public baths could be constructed. These are the Forum Baths of the late second century, the largest in Ostia. But water and drainage are always crucial in town development. 
By the late 4th century, Ostia even had lavish public latrines such as this. Yet proper drainage must have been constructed from the start, taking rainwater and waste away to the sea. This meat market, for instance, was handsomely restored under Augustus. Its courtyard centered on a communal water tank. The court was surrounded by runnels taking water away to the main drains with their carefully cut stone covers. This shop nearby sold cooked and wet fish. The oven and water tank remain, as does the marble slab. It would have needed a good water supply to keep the produce fresh. Elaborate specialist shops of this sort were few and far between in Ostia. For instance, only two bakeries have been found so far in the two-thirds of the town that has been excavated. Rows of millstones would have been turned by slaves, producing large quantities of flour. The bread was probably distributed by small retailers, but the bakery itself was a big business, covering nearly a thousand square meters, the equivalent of six good-sized shops. There were also one or two market buildings like this, consisting solely of groups of shops. It's an elegant little mall and consists of 18 separate units, each with the usual mezzanine floor, elegantly built and grouped round a secluded courtyard. The building dates from the reign of Hadrian and neatly demonstrates the final quality of Roman urban service building, combining simplicity with function and comfort. The buildings we have seen are not widely scattered, but cater for all the practical needs of life in Ostia. Large numbers of insulae of varying qualities housed the inhabitants. A few of the very rich had individual houses, but it was the warehouses that provided the commercial life of the town. For recreation, there were large public baths as well as a number of private ones, and then, of course, there were the bakeries, the markets, and the shopping malls. And finally, also, the hundreds of small shops fronting the streets. The town was managed by two duovers and two ediles, supported by the council of about a hundred, based on the curia. There were the religious organizations, and, of course, a series of trade guilds, each with its own headquarters all aspects of life tightly meshed together. Three of these aspects, religious, social and economic, all came together in what survives as the grandest single public monument of Ostia, the theatre. Now elegantly clad in red brick, it was originally built under Augustus, probably on the initiative of Agrippa, in large blocks of tufa, some of which are visible where the cladding has fallen away. Its auditorium could seat some 3,000 spectators at the popular and free spectacles, farces and mimes. The adjoining colonnades enclosed a grand court, such as Vitruvius describes. This centered on a fine temple. While round it, the colonnades themselves enclosed rows of offices. These were used by the shippers and traders, who may have begun to gather here as early as the Augustan period. The surviving mosaics, with their images of ships and the produce they carried, are a vivid reminder of the variety and special importance of this little town at the centre of the imperial trade web.
the reign of Augustus, there were at the eastern edge of the Roman Empire a number of client kingdoms. Of the kings of these, it is Herod of Judea who is the best remembered, through both the Gospel of Matthew and the works of Josephus. But still extant in Israel today, the most eloquent testimony to this extraordinary man and the best evidence of the forces at work on and within him are the remains of the great building program he undertook. In the north, he rebuilt two cities. Of Caesarea, Josephus wrote, he noticed on the coast a town called Strato's Tower. He rebuilt it entirely with limestone and adorned it with a most splendid palace. He constructed a harbour bigger than the Piraeus. On rising ground opposite the harbour mouth stood Caesar's temple of exceptional size and beauty. Little remains of this splendour. He also built this much restored theatre and a hippodrome. The city, Sebaste, was Samaria, the capital of the ancient northern kingdom of Israel destroyed by the Assyrians in 721 BC. Herod renamed it from the Greek Sebastos Augustus. Much of what we see is of later construction, but the round towers are Hellenistic, incorporated in the newer walls. Josephus says that Sebaste was to be a fortress against the people. He settled in it mercenaries and non-Jews from the surrounding area. And in the centre of the new town created a vast shrine dedicated to Augustus. The precincts were 300 yards in length. In the retaining walls there are courses of masonry from the time of the kings of Israel. And above we see the first, rather worn examples of the finely cut masonry of Herod's time. Herod also allotted the settlers some land of excellent quality. At Samaria, as at Caesarea, we see Herod looking towards Rome, showing his loyalty to Augustus. He was also creating cities with pagan temples and Greek constitutions, and providing himself with a reserve of Gentile manpower for internal security. In two places, Jerusalem and Hebron, Herod put his desire for prestige and glory to the service of the Jewish religion, to which his people had been converted some generations earlier. Nothing now remains of the temple itself, but we can see very clearly the huge platform Herod built. At the southern end is the grey dome of the Aksa Mosque. On the centre of the platform, on the site of the temple itself, is the Dome of the Rock. At the north end is the site of Herod's Antonia Tower, of which there are no definite remains. At the southeast corner is the pinnacle of the temple, from which, according to Christian tradition, James, the brother of Jesus, was thrown. Here we can clearly see the beautifully cut Herodian blocks. Above, the masonry is decayed, and above that is the inferior masonry of later builders. On top of this southern wall stood the magnificent two-story royal basilica with its row of columns. Some of them were reused below. Beneath the Aksa Mosque is this stairway, parts of which are original. It led from the temple above to the city below. By its side are a number of ritual baths, mikvahot. People step down into them before going up into the temple area. 
The steps led to the gates in the southern wall, through which people passed on their way up to the temple. The triple gate and the double gate, part of the lintel of which is visible in the shadow of a medieval building. Behind this walled up gate, and in a rather disfigured condition, are the original Herodian passageways and steps leading to an exit on the temple platform. This Herodian ceiling boss is an impressive remnant. The place of trumpeting where the onset of each Sabbath was announced to the people of the city is above the southwest corner. A Herodian street runs along the south wall. To the left, the beginning of the street, running northward, is also visible. Above that street is the springing of what is called Robinson's Arch. It was in fact a stairway which descended to street level through two left turns. It is here, among the extensive excavations, that one can see the massive Herodian stones thrown down by the Romans in 70 AD from the top of the walls. This, literally, was the destruction of the temple. Since that calamitous event, Orthodox Jews have worshipped at a point northward on the western side, traditionally called the Wailing Wall, of which the lower seven courses are Herodian. Because of its proximity to the site of the Holy of Holies, it's a place of special significance to the Jewish people. Beside the wall is a row of medieval arches, which carry the causeway directly onto the temple court. Within, the largest arch is Herodian in its lower courses and springs directly from the western wall and now serves as the ceiling of a synagogue. The later rebuilt upper section must follow the original arch very closely. Herod's temple and temple court and its enormous substructure rivaled in scale the grandest projects of Augustus himself. But only its base remains. There is though a building which gives us an impression of what it was like. This is the tomb of the patriarchs, built over the cave of Mark Pela at Hebron. Josephus describes it, their tombs are shown in the little town to this day, of really fine marble and of exquisite workmanship. In AD 333, a Christian pilgrim wrote, a remarkably beautiful tomb on which are laid Abraham, Israel, Jacob, Sarah, Rebecca and Leah. The Crusader church inside provides a roof. It now serves as a mosque, and inside that is a small synagogue. It's approximately 30 by 60 yards, a much smaller construction than the temple. But the higher levels of the building, with stones laid in flat pilasters, is our best evidence or what the outer walls of the temple court looked like. The masonry is well preserved and exhibits the delicate and classically severe workmanship of Herod's time. So far as we know, this tomb and the temple were Herod's only religious architecture. His most characteristic buildings were palaces and fortresses, typically on hilltop sites overlooking the Dead Sea or Jordan Valley, like these four. Two others we shall look at later. There was also the Winter Palace of Jericho, and then the Great Palace in the upper city of Jerusalem, covering about four and a half acres known only from Josephus' description, which was used to build this model. 
Its magnificence and equipment were unsurpassable, surrounded as it was on every side by a wall 45 feet high, with ornamental towers evenly spaced along it. The open spaces were all green lawns. It was everywhere plentifully adorned with bronze statues. Set into the city wall a little to the north were three towers superior in size, beauty and strength to any in the whole world. This is the sole survivor. It conforms to Josephus' description being solid at the base with a vast cistern above and with chambers above that. Like the others, it was both a fortress and a luxurious palace. So too was Masada, towering above the Dead Sea. There was already a fortress here, built by Jonathan Maccabeus in the second century BC. But it was entirely reconstructed by Herod as early as the 30s BC as a fortress against Cleopatra of Egypt and also against the Jewish people. An aerial view of the excavations confirms Josephus that a wall, originally with towers, was built all round the cliff edge. Much of the top was used for cultivation. The area is large, about 600 yards north to south and a maximum of 300 yards west to east. There were groups of buildings on the west side, on the north tip of the plateau, and on a series of steps descending down from there. It was thus, first of all, a fortress. From below, from almost any angle, it appears totally impregnable. When it was occupied in the great Jewish revolt of A.D. 66 to A.D. 74 by the resistance group known as the Sicarii, they found stores of food laid down in Herod's time and arms sufficient for 10,000 men. There is also a vast series of systems for collecting rainwater. This is one of the largest near the south end of the plateau. It is hollowed out in the rock and reached by a long flight of steps. Two further holes in the rock gave light and allowed more rainwater to flow in. But it wasn't just a functional military establishment. Here, among the buildings on the upper plateau of the northern palace, is a standard example of a Greco-Roman bathhouse. But the most brilliantly original architectural features are these three luxurious public rooms, which occupy the northernmost end of the plateau. The highest level is a semicircular balcony attached to the rest of the palace complex on the plateau. On the terrace below is a round room projecting out over the vertical rock and resting on two concentric circular walls. It joins a pillared hall built against the rock face and was linked to the upper terrace by a stairway. Forty-five feet below is a square terrace built out over the cliff on supporting walls. The central area was surrounded by a portico with columns. Here there is a particularly well-preserved decorative wall plaster on the rock face which formed the south side of the hall. The exact functions of these rooms cannot be certain. All that is obvious is that they were intended for pleasure, designed to take advantage of the view of the Dead Sea and eastward to the hills of Moab, and had no practical military purpose. Representing, as they do, the introduction of refined urban domestic architecture into a spectacular desert landscape, they must be regarded as among the most original and striking architectural achievements 
from the ancient world. If Masada is much the best known of Herod's palaces, the last few years have seen the uncovering of remarkable palace buildings, southwest of Jericho, not a hilltop site this time. These have the particular interest that it was here that Herod spent the last few days of his life, and here that he died in 4 BC. This palace was not a fortress. It lay on ground sloping down towards the fertile plain beside the Jordan. According to Josephus, it was between Mount Kypros and the former palace of the Hasmonean kings that Herod built another palace on both banks of the Wadi Kelt, finer and better equipped for his periods of residence, and named two parts of it after Augustus and Agrippa. Excavations of the site are continuing in the shadow of Mount Kypros, where Herod had another of his hilltop fortresses. Northwards, we can see an extensive building on the plateau above the steep slope down to the wadi. It had a suite of luxurious public rooms. These included a bathhouse and a large reception hall. This room had a particularly elaborate structure. There is some well-preserved opus reticulatum, the network pattern of bricks so characteristic of contemporary Rome. Given its much less spectacular location and its construction in mud brick and concrete, this site can hardly now convey its original grandeur or luxury. In order to imagine that, it may be well to remind ourselves of the reconstruction of the palace in Jerusalem, two parts of which were also named after Augustus and Agrippa. Nearby at Tel Es Samrat, there was a small mud brick theatre adjacent to an amphitheatre. The oval outline of the complex is visible in the paths of an Arab farm. It was in this amphitheatre, a few days before his death, that Herod ordered leading men from all over Judea to assemble. He then had them locked in with orders that if he should die, they should all be killed, so that universal mourning would not fail to follow his death. In fact, few mourned Herod. His body was taken to Herodion, the last of his palace fortresses. Josephus described it this fortress, which is eight miles from Jerusalem, is naturally strong and very suitable for such a structure. For reasonably nearby is a hill raised to a greater height by the hand of man and rounded off in the shape of a breast. It has a steep ascent formed of 200 steps of hewn stone. Within it are costly royal apartments made for security and for ornament at the same time. There were four towers on the perimeter surrounding the palace. Of these towers, the eastern is the best preserved. From the top, we look east over the Judean desert to the Dead Sea and the hills of Moab, and northeast almost to Bethlehem and Jerusalem. Through the main gate to the courtyard is the garden with a peristyle around it.
Beyond is the triclinium, or dining room, surrounded by smaller rooms. On the other side of the peristyle is a bathhouse. The tepidarium is well preserved. It's made, like the rest of the palace, of stone and has an elegant and very early domed roof. There was also a lower city of considerable elegance. Round the base he built other royal apartments to accommodate his furniture and his friends, so that in its completeness the stronghold was a town, in its compactness a palace. When Herod died, the Jews held in the amphitheatre at Jericho were released. Josephus described the funeral procession. There was a solid gold bier adorned with precious stones and draped with the richest purple. On it lay the body wrapped in crimson. It was followed by his spearmen, the Thracian company, and his Germans and Gauls, all in full battle order. The rest of the army led the way, fully armed. The body was borne to Herodian, where it was buried. His golden coffin has never been found. Other questions about Herod's buildings remain unanswered. Where did he find his engineers and architects? How did he pay for his grandiose projects? What is clear is that they led to very little except Herod's self-glorification. In the Christian tradition, he is remembered only as the king who massacred the innocents and the future of the Jewish people lay in quite other values from those of Herod. Town and country are very closely linked in Italy, the produce of the country providing the wealth of the town. We are now driving northwards out of the city of Rome, and very soon we'll be in the rich, fertile countryside of southern Etruria. Italy, under Augustus, was particularly prosperous and successful, both in political and in an economic sense, and in this program we shall try to see why. It's a story that has its roots in the events of the previous few centuries during the birth and growth of the Roman Republic. Roads, as everyone knows, serves to link town and country. They get the produce into the town. And of course, as everyone also knows, all roads go to Rome. But here in Italy, they also served another function, that of enabling unification to take place, whether one's talking about 19th century unification or the unification that took place in Italy in Roman times. Here, we're on the Via Flaminia, and if we can get across it safely, what do we find? Well, we're standing on the precursor of this, the present day Flaminia, on, in fact, its Roman predecessor. And here we see the stones uh, which provide its surface, made of a hard basalt called selchi, quarried locally, and as you can see, incredibly durable. Now this surface is more than 2,000 years old. We know, in fact, its exact date, 27 BC, because this is when Augustus had the Via Flaminia completely repaired over its 209 miles of length going off to, to Rimini in northeast Italy. Uh, he did this certainly to help the unification of the country, and as we look at it, uh, we see 
a road which I suspect goes back even before that. Uh, we believe that it was first laid out by the Roman consul Gaius Flaminius in 220 BC, and probably there's an Etruscan road again beneath that. So, roads here serve not just an important aspect from the angle of communication, they have a political function as well, and Augustus above all realized that. As Rome began her conquest of Italy, and that's a process which began as long ago as, what, 500 years before Augustus, she found that various parts of the peninsula were quite urbanized. One thinks, for example, of the south of Italy, which had been colonized long before by the Greeks, uh, the Greeks who had uh, planted so many cities that it was known as Greater Greece. Or one thinks of uh, where we are now, that's to say in Etruria, where the Etruscans had a great many small city-states. And in fact, here we are in Orbitello, in a small Etruscan town. Now, what was the Roman treatment of these towns? Well, of course, it varied. Some it tried to prop up, some they bypassed when they put in the new roads, and others they raised to the ground, building new towns in their place. And here, at Orbitello, looking across the great lagoon of Orbitello, we see one of the early Roman new towns. Cosa. We are here 85 miles northwest of Rome, standing on a high rocky knoll overlooking the Tyrrhenian Sea. And it was here at Cosa that in the year 273 BC that a party of colonists was sent out by the Roman Senate from the city of Rome. Altogether, how many there were of them, we're not sure, but it's probably uh, a settlement of some 2,500 families, let's say at a guess, some 9,000 people. And they were coming into this area uh, as people who were very much entering into frontier country. It had been conquered only, uh, what, seven years before. Uh, it was um, an area on the whole insecure, and they were there partly for solid strategic reasons. But we come to Koza for rather different reasons. Firstly, because it's been very well studied through excavation by the American school at Rome, and secondly, and perhaps equally important, because it is a site where we can see the processes of experimentation in the creation of colonies actually going on. Our colonists here found themselves in difficult, even dangerous territory, and thus their first essential action was to protect themselves, to secure their position. And so, as we can see here behind me, they built themselves a massive, solid wall made in a style familiar to them from their Latin cities around Rome, so-called polygonal masonry, and this massive, secure wall extends for no less than nearly one mile around their town. Despite the difficult, awkward terrain which characterizes this hilltop at Cosa, the surveyors nevertheless decided to lay out the town in long rectangular blocks. What's more, uh, they decided to create properly paved streets using the hard local limestone uh, that we see in this area. And indeed, the streets saw so much use that the carts and vehicles eventually carved deep ruts in it, like this example that we have here. Then, beside the roads, we have, of course, the houses of these early colonists. And uh, some of these are large, elegant examples. And let's, in fact, take a look at this one here. This is very clearly a splendid house owned by one of the most patrician, well-to-do members of the community at Cosa, with a series of rooms round a central court. This court is really designed for two reasons. First of all, it lets in light to illuminate these, these rooms. And secondly, it's designed to be a device for collecting rainwater, which accumulates in this impluvium here, and then is subsequently stored in that cistern that we see nearby. 
been around, we have these really rather elegant, handsome reception rooms. Rooms which on their floors have fine pavements, which to some extent anticipate the great mosaics of the imperial age. And then on the walls, and we can see some fine examples here, uh, we have rather elegantly done wall pasta, sometimes with painted decoration too. And in a house such as this, we find many remains of containers, known as amphorae, which were used for the carrying and storage of wine and oil, a major reason for Coza's prosperity. The word colony comes from the Latin verb colare, which means to cultivate. So where then did the cultivators of the countryside around Coza bring and sell their produce? Well, the answer is here. And here we are in the form of Coza, a long rectangular court surrounded on at least two sides by shops and within one corner what appears to be a fish market. But administration and justice was also sorted out here as well. And then here in this open circular space surrounded by these seats we have the Comitium, that's to say an open assembly point where people could discuss matters of importance. And then behind me here we have the Basilica, a large multi-purpose hall, but that's where the justice was sorted out. And this combination of basilica and forum was a model which was to be adopted in almost every Roman town of importance in the Western Empire. This beautiful spot was the arx or capital of the town, that's to say the religious focus. Over there we have a small temple dedicated to a, a Latin goddess, but more importantly, here behind me, we have the major temple of the town. That is to say, a building divided at the back into three rooms, one here, the central one, and one over on that side. And then in front, a great facade, decorated in the Etruscan manner with terracottas. This temple, harking back to Rome, was dedicated to three Roman deities, Jupiter, Juno, and Minerva. And this was a conscious link between the colony and her mother city. However, the very eminent position of the town underlines another important function of it. But here we have a natural refuge. And this, I think, explains why down here behind me we have a great deep system, a water storage system, something which is a very common feature on this waterless hilltop, uh, so that the supply is there in case of necessity. However, it's looking down from this eminence over the surrounding countryside that underlines Coza's prosperity, this immensely rich, fertile farmland. Moreover, we can also see the port, the point from which the produce could be shipped down to Rome, to other parts of Italy, and indeed even abroad. And of course, this underlines a crucial feature of the ancient world, that at that time, sea transport or water transport was much easier, convenient and cheaper than land transport. And there across the lagoon is Orbitello, an Etruscan stronghold, and thus always a threat to the security of the colonists of Coza. Nevertheless, despite that threat, the territory was extensively farmed. Banks, as we can see here, marked by a scarf and bushes, divided up the land on the principle known as centuriation. It worked out as one small holding per colonial family. Before long, however, some families began to expand at the expense of their neighbours, building on their plots the celebrated Roman villas. There are three finely preserved Republican examples near to Coza. These Republican villas emphasise the close relationship that grew up between town and country. Indeed, some display their wealth in the form of revetment walls, which imitate, by use of miniature towers, the form of the facade of a Roman town wall. The extravagance of the period was in fact so great that these three neighbouring villas felt the need to adopt more or less identical architectural expressions of their affluence. 
Here we've moved out into the territory of the colony of Kozer, a territory of some 200 square miles, to the site of one of these immensely rich and ostentatious late Republican villas that are found within the area. Excavations currently being carried out by an Italian and English team have shown that it was probably built in the late 1st century BC. And despite the fact that what we see here is essentially ostentatious architecture, it nevertheless was a working farm. It's surrounded by this very rich farmland supporting good cereals, uh, wine and olive production, and the excavator, uh, Professor Andrea Carandini, has estimated that something like a surplus of 100,000 litres a year of wine was produced on this estate. So we've seen how the working side of the farm is of fundamental importance in these great uh, late Republican villas, uh, an importance which really is underlined by the buildings that the excavators have found. Uh, for example, barns, a uh, complex that they believe are pigsties, and most important of all, the remains of wine presses and oil presses. This, as it were, epitomizes the reasons for the prosperity and wealth of the Augustan age. Here, however, we've moved up one level uh, across a great ornamental garden, and we're beside a terrace wall, a terrace wall which marks the limit between the garden and the Villa Urbana, the, own, the place where the master uh, lived. Who then was this master? Well, unfortunately, we can still only guess, but there are some hints from the stamped amphora handles at Cosa. There they mentioned the family, the great senatorial family, the Sesti, and stamped handles of the Sesti have been found at this site too. We can't more than conjecture that it's the same link, but it's a pretty good guess at this moment. So we move first into this cryptoporticus at the back of the ornamental garden. That's to say a, a great covered walk walkway a marvellous example of Roman architecture of its time using concrete faced in one or two places with uh, wall plaster which would of course have been handsomely decorated. Then through a ramp up onto a level above us which is where the main residence would have been. A handsome residence with a lodger on two sides giving marvellous views over the countryside uh, with a great peristyle, a colonnaded court uh, reception rooms beautifully decorated with painted wall plaster and then behind that an atrium uh, resembling the atrium with, that we saw earlier at Cosa. This then is a handsome residence where uh, the Villa Urbana is twinned with the working side of the farm, a model which was adopted in buildings of this sort of status and class all over Augustan Italy. Now the wealth produced by the villas and towns of Republican and Augustan Italy went, in terms of traded objects, far beyond the confines of Italy itself. And we can see this by a visit to any great museum, such as the British Museum. Take, for example, this magnificent decorated silver cup with its fine leaves, with its bunches of olives, uh, with its grapes, all succulent and rich and symbolizing that prosperity brought about by the villa and by the countryside. In fact, it's one of a set of silver Augustan cups that comes from Hockwold in eastern England. And it was perhaps to a gift to a, a native prince, because at that time Britain lay beyond direct Roman control. Now, of course, much of the trade must have been imperishable materials. One thinks of textiles or wooden objects but most particularly of wine and oil. Wine and oil were both shipped in these distinctive containers, uh, amphorae, uh, whose form and type gives us a clue to where they were made and what sort of material they had inside them. And uh, along with lamps, of which we have a lovely example here with a figure on one side, and then on the other we have a name. Uh, this is the name of the firm that produced it, and along with Ambery, uh, these firms often stamped their ways, wares, enabling us to reconstruct the pattern of trade. But perhaps the most distinctive uh, 
tableware object of this period is this high red gloss pottery that we call Aratine ware because much is made at Arezzo in northeastern Etruria. Sometimes the ware is plain, other times it's decorated uh, with figures, figures which were produced in a mold like this one here with these lovely uh, dancing ladies. And it's a ware which gets more or less everywhere, certainly in Britain, even as far afield as southern India. Republican and Augustan Italy, therefore, uh, produced and exported its produce very extensively. But it was not an industrial country as we would understand the term. Most firms were pretty small, rarely employing more than, say, a dozen slaves. And the trade, too, was small scale. Most of markets would have been the local market in the local town. And it's the growth of these towns that's one of the distinctive and characteristic features of late Republican and Augustan Italy. Italy, too, has 28 colonies founded by my authority, which were densely populated in my lifetime. Those are the words of Augustus himself, taken from the rest, Gestae, and here, a few miles to the north of Rome, at Lucas Feroniae, we're in one of those Augustan colonies. So, who were these colonies founded for? Well, again, he's very helpful. A little earlier in the, in the race, Gestae, uh, he says this, I settled rather more than 300,000 of these, and he's talking about soldiers, uh, in colonies, all sent them back to their hometowns after their period of service. To all of these I assigned lands or gave money as rewards for their military service. In other words, here Augustus is looking after his veterans, uh, he's settling them down so they won't be a problem, he's creating the beginnings of a professional army. Now, where were these colonies? Well, one here, but most in the north of Italy. One thinks of sites like Aosta, uh, founded in 25 BC, and in its layout very much like a military camp, and to, uh, one thinks, uh, of others in that region. But here, at Lucas Freniae, near to Rome, we have not a colony of veterans, but for ordinary resettled people. And it's a fascinating site in that excavations over the last 20 years have disclosed a great deal about the layout of this sort of town. And many of its features hark back to what we've seen at Cosa. One important difference we see behind us here, where we have a massive temple at the end of the forum. And this temple, appropriately enough, is of course dedicated to Augustus himself. There was another older temple too, it lies over on that side of the Forum, built a couple of hundred years earlier and dedicated to the goddess Feronia, hence the name Lucas Feroniae. That's on one side. And then, whilst we know little about that part of the Forum, down here we have a magnificent uh, array of shops and bars, the sort of place that you could stop and take a glass of wine uh, with your friends. And then perhaps uh, one might want to go down to the end of the forum where we find a suite of baths, another public place, another public complex. So here in this town at Lucas Feroniae, we can see something of the layout of an Augustan town, a plan which now, in many features, has become standardized not just through Italy, but elsewhere too. One immediately striking feature about the topography of Lucas Veronii is the flatness of the ground, with beyond the Tiber Valley and the Sabine Hills. It is, I think, a marvellous illustration of the peace and security that Augustus brought to Italy. Well, we've seen how important Roman roads are, and here we are, right beside Italy's main trunk road, the Autostrada del Sole but we're also in the outskirts of the town of Lucas Feroniae, at one of the big suburban villas, one of the villas of the masters. 
And here we can see its layout with the atrium, the residence area, beyond that a garden. Then the working part of the estate, and then a great peristyle surrounded by small rooms that some people think may have been to house slaves. Now slaves were one of the great problems uh, of Republican and early Imperial Italy. The wars of conquest brought in uh, a lot of people, slaves were cheap, and wealth came from the wars of conquest. And the problem was that as the rich enlarged their estates using slaves, so did the free men, poor free men, become dispossessed. They were away fighting in the wars. And this ultimately was to lead to turmoil and conflict, the sort of problem that Augustus had to try and cope with. And here we are in the residential part of the villa, in the great court lined by a peristyle. Most of this section of the villa was laid out by a family who appeared to have acquired the estate in the first century AD. This sumptuously decorated room is the Lorarium, or the shrine of the villa. And it's this room which gives us the name of the owners, the rich owners of this, of this building. Um, they're a family called the Veluzzi. But it's more than that, I think. It's also a symbol of the power and affluence and wealth of these very rich late Republican and early Imperial families. A wealth that they felt a need to display in a very ostentatious way, and a wealth which was to bring conflict uh, in a social sense, in a political sense, and quite often in a military sense as well. These were the sort of problems that Augustus had to face and cope with, and he did so in several ways. Firstly, by settling his retired soldiers, his veterans, in the new towns, in the colonies, uh, in Italy and elsewhere. Secondly, by reducing or even destroying the power of the late Republican uh, families and by elevating new ones, like, for example, the Veluzzi here. But above all, and this I think is the thing which is important, by creating the conditions for peace so that Italy, with an emperor for the first time, and with peaceful conditions could look forward to a prosperous future.